Korea and Libya. Please, Oli. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for inviting me to this uh, nice sunny country. It was a really hard time to get here from Boston and the East Coast because the uh, airfields were closed for two days, no private car was allowed to use, and the la very last hurdle was how to get to the airport because there were no taxis. But then my wife was innovative enough, she's an organizer of the family, so she got a cap for me and I got on route. Uh, the title, as was mentioned, is the verification experiences from Iraq, Libya, Iran, and North Korea. So this covers 20 years. 20 years is a long time, even uh, in our proliferation and non-proliferation history. And if you go to a working place, a any institution, normally one generation is 10 years. So now we cover a period of two generations and how the IAS safeguards changed during that period. Uh, when I look those four countries also, they are, there are commonalities, but there are a lot of different uh, features. So we should judge this, uh, uh, each case on its own merits, and you cannot draw an overall conclusion. Uh, but let me start with the Article 3 of the NPT, which says that the objective is to prevent diversion of nuclear energy to nuclear weapons. My father was a lawyer, and he said always to me that the law is not how it is written, it is how it is read. And I do my reading for the NPT now. It says it's a prevention, so which means that we need to act before diversion takes place. That's obvious. But then the next term, nuclear energy, it's actually more than nuclear material. IASFCAS is pretty much uh, uh, based on detection of early detection of diversion of nuclear material. But nuclear material is not the same as energy. And this brings me to the spirit of the NPT, which really is there to block, actually, uh, manufacturing and uh, design of nuclear weapons, if you look at the spirit. And this comes to, the, for example, the compliance of Iran. I think that I have a little bit uh, different view with Anton, whether the Iran has been uh, following the spirit of the NPT by certain weaponization-related activities. But uh, then, let's go now by one by one, the lessons learned. And uh, when we talk about the IAEA experiences and, and start with Iraq, this was the eye-opener where we saw that if the IAEA safeguards is solely based on detection of diversion of nuclear material, a lot of things happen parallel. And when we come to the point that someone diverts, we will say, oops, too late. Because they had meanwhile developed a nuclear weapon. They have been perhaps two screwdriver turns away of assembling weapon. And certainly this will have a tremendous impact on, uh, on the credibility of the NPT and also the work of the IAEA. And therefore, the Board of Governors in early 1990s decided that the IAEA has to go look also behind the nuclear materials to make sure that there's un no undeclared nuclear material and activities. And they used the word activities in 1992 when the Board made this decision. And activities, is a, uh, it's a product uh, context than just uh, dealing with the nuclear material, and this was uh, nuclear weapons also included to those studies. Certainly, the IAEA, when it got the mandate from United Nations Security Council, it was much more far-reaching because it also included dismantling of Saddam's nuclear weapons programs. But this is the challenge which the agency is facing now today, and I don't think that the international community and the IAEA membership has really fully grasped that what is the IAEA role there with regard to the verification in weaponization. Uh, should it do? Should it not do? How far it can go? Maybe also the IAEA secretariat has sometimes been a little bit uh, maybe careless in formulating uh, uh, our statements, and here I look, for example, the Iran report in spring 2004, when we said, wrote there something like that, the IAEA uh, 
authority in verification nuclear weapons uh, related activities is limited. If you go now to the debate, for example, arms control won't in the US, they say actually you have no role there at all. But when El Baradai wrote this limited, it didn't mean that there is no role, but we are a little bit uh, narrow, or our access rights and authorities are less than perhaps in the some other cases. But uh, I think it's an instrumental part of the approach, because you, you need to understand uh, what, the, what is the purpose of the nuclear material? Are, are these all what I see? Are they all what should be there? Which might be the intentions, even though the intentions are difficult to measure. But I think this is one of those uh, uh, topics which the next MPT review conference perhaps have to look again that is it really that uh, IAEA needs a little bit more authorities or new interpretations there. And then we need also to remember one more thing when we go to the safeguards agreement. NPT says diver, prevent diversion of nuclear energy to nuclear weapons. But when you go to the safeguards agreement, actually it goes a little bit further. Nuclear weapons or purposes unknown. So therefore, when you see diversion, you still need to think that, you know, why it is there when you come to the compliance. And it's not perhaps always clear that it's a nuclear weapons process, particularly if you have to prove it. Prove is uh, much more difficult, yeah, and much of this is uh, also put to the secretariat, I think unnecessarily at this point of time, this burden of proof. And I take now uh, as an example the IAEA request to go to Parchin in Iran. So there is a one group of people, first of all, who says that it's not in your authority at all, regardless what they do there. I don't think that I buy that. Then there is another group which says, and these are the uh, arms control wonkers, you know, say that, you know, yes, but you need to have a proof that it's a nuclear weapons related, yet then you can go. But this is almost like a fingerprint in a crime scheme, so you cannot go to take the fingerprint because they don't let you to go there. So therefore, you don't have the proof. So it's a chicken and egg thing. And I think that this is the area where I think UN Security Council resolutions have been very good for the IAEA, but unfortunately, this has not transmitted to the, info, uh, to the atmosphere inside the agency, particularly because some of our small group of countries are pretty much against it. And, uh, this kind of approach, and they want to limit the IAEA access there. So the lesson here is that let's look at it in more open way so that the IAEA can, can really stay for that and per, meet the high standard which it has set. When you look at the safeguards agreement, the first centers, which is those countries which have nuclear uh, or have comprehensive safeguards agreement in force and additional protocol. The IAEA annual statement is that all nuclear material in this country is in, peace, is in peaceful use. It's actually a quite, a, quite a requirement because at the same time it's not only that you accounted all of it, you have not seen any undeclared activities, but you on top of that conclude that it's all for peaceful. And I, I give you an example, which might be a little bit wicked example. Let's assume that uh, someone wants to produce tritium for a nuclear initiator. You can do it in a research reactor. You put the lithium target there. You p produce tritium, then you extract tritium, and you have your deuterium, and beautiful, you can make your initiator. Actually, I, I, I cannot go to the reactor very easily and do the examination of records to see that uh, ha, have they produced lit, uh, lithium or have they irradiated lithium targets or not. But still, apart from that, it gives a statement that the uh, reactor has been used for peaceful purposes. So there are some gray areas which we ought to look. Then, if we look at the experiences from the past, and the new tools. There are basically two sets of tools which we should look. One is the environmental sampling, 
and one is the information analysis, which was discussed by Rose this morning. I think it was a very good remark from her. Let's look environmental samples and how important they are. I sometimes, when the students are in Harvard, I said that there's no perfect crime. Every crime leaves a small mark. So does nuclear material when it is treated. And not long time ago, a friend of mine wrote that the IAEA was not able to say that the uranium particles which were found in Syria were man-made. That's what he said, that the IAEA doesn't have tools, and it, because uranium is a very common element in nature, so you, this can come from the natural sources, and it's not there as uh, you think. Actually, this shows an example how the IAEA deals with the, uh, not only by chemical means that measures how much uranium, what is the isotopes, which are the impurities, but makes much more complex analysis of the behavior, the distribution of the, of the particles, which way they are there, and what's the argumentation that they were uh, a result of explosion. It's written tiny, in a tiny small way in the IAEA reports, but basically it's a following. When we went in uh, July, well, it was actually last week of June 2008, to Alki Bar, the body was already moved a year earlier. So there was only a new building with the Scott missiles in it, and they said that this is a, has always been a missile site, but now you, you got there. And actually, they were very nice. They were even willing to demonstrate us how to fuel a missile. But we came there for sample taking, so we didn't spend too much time for that. So what the IAEA did used a combination of satellite imagery. So we looked from the satellite imagery how they had done the cleaning operations. But then we saw their weak spots where the soils had not been moved, where small pieces of buildings had been landed. Syrians were very tough with us. They didn't take us to take any piece of uh, building with us. That was a non-starter. Environmental sampling has to be uh, environmental. Sand, water, uh, whatever grows on the soil, even though nothing much grows there. So, but the sand is sand, and uh, you know, if there is a small particle of the building, you cannot distinguish that. So we took those samples from those areas where they had done less cleaning, then went through offices, toilets, change rooms, and then buildings also at a higher level than ground level. And surprise, surprise, we found their man-made uranium particles, which were uranium oxides. No sign of silicate, which is the one with normal form, which, uh, which uh, uh, uranium is on, on in nature. But then the analysis went f further, and we did what was called morphology with the help of scientists from five different countries participated in this exercise. Found out that you know it was not distributed like a salting type of thing, because the way the particles were distributed and the locations we found, the particles were uh, not spherical. If you use, a, let's say, a penetrator or something like that. When it hits the target, it practically evaporates and more forms droplets. These were shrapnels, tiny small shrapnels. Then they didn't have any additives which you normally use if you have a uranium metal and you put it to the shape. This was pure, pure uranium metal. Unfortunately, it was oxi oxide, so we didn't know the original form of the compound. But it was very clear that it most likely didn't come with a bombing. It got somehow distributed at site. Since it was in a shrapnel, it most likely was a result of violent action, which is probably when a bombing hits target. And most likely those buildings then had uranium. Which kind of uranium it was, I don't think we can tell today. This is still space and room for the scientists, because these particles were about uh, I think 0.1 micrometer. You can you can start to see with the naked eye and with the magnifying glass 
whether it's there. But this is something I think that the nanotechnology people probably will find out that we, we can analyze it in the middle of the particle. What it was, was it uranium metal or not? Because that would be a very good comparison then to the North Korean uranium metal, which we might know. So this is just an example of the powerful tools. And therefore, when we talk about the places like the parts in which the IAEA wants to have an access, there is a chance, even though you know it's been delayed and blocked, and most likely some decontamination activities or refurbishing is on, on way. But this is an example where the IAEA uses much wider information analysis basis to make conclusions. And then let's go take one more step forward with the problem of parching. If the IAEA gets there and it's been sanitized, let's assume that there's a sanitization or they just end up with inconclusive. Then comes the other part of the, this game, which is the information analysis using procurement information, using information, scientific publication, uh, using information from intelligence sources. How to use that? Actually, you combine all those. They are either support each other or they don't support. They can be inconclusive. The new thing what the IAEA has done, and which unfortunately is not published, we started to assign uncertainties to this information. So this is likely, highly likely, likely, less likely. And the dilemma here is that you actually combine very accurate measured information with qualitative information for your overall conclusions. And there, I think that the secretary sometimes fails to convey the message how sure we are. And then the way the IAEA works with the intelligence information, it doesn't take it as a face value, even though there might be a track history with the country and person who gives the information. You check the veracity of the information. You try with the other means to authenticate how reliable it is. Is it something which you can use for your conclusions? And sometimes, again, you assign an uncertainty value to that, and then you come with the overall conclusion. And these are the changes which came in last, I would say, five to 10 years to IAEA safeguards. Then, when we started to peel, now I call like a road, road story, uh, to peel the issue of Syria or Iran, uh, IAEA has a lot of inspection authorities, as routine inspections, design information visits, if that is some protocol is enforced, there is a uh, <coughs> complementary access. And the strength of the IAEA safeguards is actually access to the people, sites, equipment, declaration, information which is provided by the state. So these are the strengths, and they have to be used to the maximum extent. And one of them is the special inspection, which is like an ultimate tool when you have exhausted all the other, other things. And unfortunately, we have not really been successful for that. For, again, maybe partially for interpretation reasons, because when this was re iterated in 1992 that special inspection is a tool which the IAEA has to use when in certain uh, circumstances. And then there was this statement in the board by Blix who said that it, it's a very rare case that special inspection is, is used. Which some people interpret that, you know, it's a kind of very special event. And you, there's a high hurdle before you can implement it. But this was not his intention. Actually, his intention was to calm down some of the countries which were thinking that now, if this is said, IAEA starts to flood in and doing a lot of special inspections which will cost uh, additional cost. But what he meant personally, and I have checked it afterwards, is that he meant that this is a rare case because most of the states are in compliance with their safeguards undertaking. So therefore, there is no need need to, to do it too often. And that has caused this that then uh, it has been extremely difficult to, 
to use, we should have used it in Syria. And why? Uh, we started to talk also in early 1990s about transparency, nuclear transparency. And I think that this nuclear transparency, so nice it is, I think it got us to a little bit on the wrong track. Uh, transparency, if you look at the original transparency, which came from 1960s and were sold these silos here, actually the idea was that uh, Russians and Americans declare certain things for each other, and then they are able to verify with national <coughs> means that those things exist. It's not the same as the IAEA nuclear transparency, which says that, you know, you let me to go here and there and provide this and this information, particularly if the proliferator is determined not to close the information so, or close the case. And when, we, when I compare the case in 1993 or 1992 autumn with the North Korea, leak started in the beginning the process by asking them to be transparent, invite us to certain sites. We got to a couple of places and then there was a war. Then he made a decision, okay, that's over for transparency. Now we go with our legal authority and we started the process of special inspections. But now when we, on the last few cases, we didn't do that. We continued the transparency. First we started the transparency with Syria soon after the bombing and went until May, nine months, pleading them to be transparent. And then they didn't, were not transparent. And then we started to walk the public procedure and still asking them to be transparent. If I look back backwards, I think it was, in my view, a small mistake from strategic point of view. They had proved that they were not transparent. Why should you expect them all, all of a sudden becoming transparent? Then the last thing, and this is to do about the red lines. Red lines, uh, how, how should we deal with them? And uh, this is to do with the debate, which is particularly with the ir ir Iran there, and these are my personal views. First of all, when we talk about the red lines, we have two things here. We have uh, capacities and capabilities. Capacity is something which I interpret as a kind of theoretical. I have, let's say, 20,000 centrifuges, and I can produce high enriched uranium in a certain period of time. Capability is for me something which I really can do in a reasonable amount of time, so that I can modify those centrifuges, do it in a short period of time in such a way that the prolifer as a proliferator I will achieve my goal, I break out before international community can take an action. And then where you put your threshold, and let's take uranium enrichment as an example. Should you put a threshold there when I can produce high enriched uranium enough for non one nuclear device, let's see, in uh, one month or two weeks time? Or should I put it uh, the limit that uh, I produce high enriched uranium, but I don't start to convert it to the weapon components? Or does the clock actually start when you have a weapon? And if you look the uh, the debate, uh, all kinds of uh, numbers and pictures are out there. But there is one thing which is forgotten from this picture, and this is the uncertainties. What we know, what we don't know. And therefore, if we take, for example, Iran as an example, and if we say that the threshold is such uh, or the timeline there is the same for that IAEA detects, detects the diversion. So let the IAEA in inspects there, let's say, in one or two week interval. So therefore, the, the breakout time maximum which is allowed is one or two weeks. I think it's a fatal error because of the unknowns. You need to have a caution because you don't know which scenario the adversary will take here. There may be undeclared facilities. The country is in non-compliance. So the non-compliance for me already means that you don't go it business as usual, but you use different criteria to set it up. And I think that I have more than exhausted the time which was available for me. So these are the 
four points I wanted to raise. Thank you. Thank you very much.